Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. And I know I'm back, I missed last week and I apologize for that, but if you can have, if you rewind to the week before, I made a little video in which we launched a rocket from an aircraft. This week I thought, what about, we? what if we launched a aircraft from a rocket, but the rocket is also an aircraft, it's an SSTO. I'm going to just stop the commentary and restart, that was horrible. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video in which I'm going to be launching an SSTO which then deploys a payload down to the surface of EVE. I thought that was much more concise, well done Matt, thank you. I just got to remember to cut off that beginning bit. Anyway, as for you know what the payload is, you can pro you've probably figured that out on screen, right? It's a small little rover. The challenge for this rover was I wanted it to deploy from a Mark II cargo bay, as in like the uh, the SR-71 uh, profile like parts that that size, uh, which meant that the actual I guess vessel that it resided in had to be using the 1.2 five meter diameter parts I think that's the size I don't even know it goes to show how much I've learned on these however many years I've been playing this game all the time but you guys know what size I mean right it had to fit inside that size configuration which actually is not very big it's very very difficult to build a rover that can fit inside those dimensions while also packing all of the science kit now admittedly I don't have every science experiment this is missing the science junior and the uh the the blue the blue one the, the air the atmospheric analyzer again another part I don't know the name of but you guys you guys know what I mean right but those two parts they're very big very clunky I think they would have really made the rover look a little, little, little bit silly so I, I I went away with I I did away with those parts and built what you can see in front of you the main piece I wanted to include was a scanning arm and I fit that on quite nicely so um. All's good there. And yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send this to Eve. This is kind of like a soft recreation, but not really, of a mission I did all the way back in 2018, which was, uh, uh, I'm gonna say six months ago, and that's when 2018 was, without, so I don't feel too sad about my life disappearing before my, before my very eyes. Anyway, as you can see on screen, I've pretty much finished the payload that's going to descend down to the surface of Eve. It's all shrouded in that fairing piece that's gonna protect the rover from the very harsh atmospheric forces of EVE re-entry. We also have an upper fairing piece that contains the parachutes that'll perform our deceleration and allow safe touchdown on the surface of EVE while also adding a bit of drag to the top of the vehicle because the center of mass is a little bit high up so it makes it a bit flip happy so th that'll just help keep things stable. I've also added a heat shield which is not going to be enough to you know survive the uh, the amount of aero braking and atmospheric deceleration we're going to be doing but it will give us enough protection to slow down so that the actual fairing plate provides sufficient protection the fairing plates are actually pretty good heat shields on their own so i only need the ablative heat shield to do the actual aero capturing that the vessel will initially be doing maybe if you wanted to do this you might want to err on the side of caution and have more than one heat shield but i i this this is also this is fine. And now it just comes to building the SSTO around the payload, which is kind of a, a backward way of designing aircraft when you think about it, right? Just have the payload first and then just build whatever aircraft around it. I guess that's kind of like the A-10 Warthog approach, isn't it? Where they just took a massive gun and then just built whatever aircraft they could around it. Now, in terms of this aircraft, I really like it, but I also really don't, you know? Like, it's really nice looking. I really like the aesthetic of it, but those big S elevons were a nightmare. Flying with SAS enabled, as in flying in, within the atmosphere with SAS enabled, meant that those elevons would just constantly pulse up and down, and the whole craft would just wobble. Oh, it was a nightmare. So um, you'll see very early on on the ascent, I'll be disabling them just to keep the ship somewhat controllable, and then on the an eventual Kerbin re-entry, we'll have to just fly very, very cautiously, because this thing did not fly very well. So if you want to download the craft file from the description, you're more than welcome to, but I would wholeheartedly advise against it. The other thing, uh, maybe I should talk about this closer to the time, but I'll probably be on some tangent about whiskey by then. So the other thing that I probably could have improved upon was the actual descent module itself. Very flip happy, but we'll come to that when we get to that phase in the mission. Right now, I'm just waiting for an EVE transfer window, which if you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to EVE, the angle that that line forms at the sun should be about 54 degrees. But uh, the crucial thing about an EVE transfer window is that unlike every other planet in the game, EVE should be behind Kerbin rather than ahead of Kerbin on the map. Anyway, oh my goodness, where are we launching from? That's right, I thought, oh, let's just mix it up. 
and launch from the island runway because and have, have I ever launched from the island runway ever in my history on this channel uh, where I've been making videos now since 2015 I don't think I've ever actually done an aircraft mission where we launched from the island runway Matt Lown historians now is your chance to tell me how I'm wrong but I'm pretty sure I've never launched from the island runway so I thought let's do a mission to and from the island runway rather than the Kerbal Space, Center, Kerbal Space Center to keep things fresh because clearly I can say island runway much easier than Kerbal Space Center. And here goes our uh, ascent. Not much to really talk about with this because I've done it so many times. You guys have probably seen me do it so many times. But uh, yeah, just holding a fairly shallow trajectory whilst we let our rapiers get us up to 440-ish meters per second, at which point they unlock their full thrust potential, at which point we can start nosing up a little bit more aggressively, maybe 20 degrees or so on the nav ball, uh, to, you know, gain sufficient altitude without burning too much fuel. I find this is the uh, the most efficient way to do your ascents. And then we're going to start gradually flying flatter and flatter as we get towards the thinner parts of the atmosphere, where the air supply for the rapiers is very sparse, so uh, try and stay at level altitude as much as we can while also picking up speed and here I am firing up the nuclear engines generally around 20 kilometers I'll fire those up and now we can just coast at a nice shallow trajectory uh, whilst we use up the last of the air supply and then the rapiers will just kick into closed cycle mode automatically which will begin in just a second and uh, I didn't actually do anything in terms of keyboard input the plane naturally started tilting up a little bit with the increased thrust and so I didn't need to do any keyboard input to uh, increase our angle of attack here and then as we ran out of oxidizer I could just you know shut down the rapier engines using action group number one and then we can just coast our way to orbit as you can see our time to apoapsis is you know four, over four minutes and climbing so plenty of time to circularize with the low thrust weight ratio of the nuclear engines so uh, yeah we can shut those down in just a second there we are now at the moment there is lots of nice sound effects as in you can hear the engines making noise uh, I've been having this problem. I think it's to do with the waterfall mod. That's what, by the way, that's what makes my engine plumes and the engine sounds look really nice and really cool sounding. Um, it's the waterfall mod. Highly recommend. But I think it's this mod that's causing me issues where sometimes the game will just stop making noises. Like the only sounds that will come from the game are um, explosions, landing gear deployment and uh, retraction and you know aerodynamic sounds like the, the whoosh from wind uh, but engines don't make any noise so i think it's the waterfall mod so i really need to um reinstall that or make sure i've got the right one for this version of kerbal space program so apologies if you notice that later on in this video when i return to kerbin with the aircraft uh, it no longer makes any noise so there's that anyway now comes to plotting our trajectory to eve and i, I mentioned before going on a massive tangent again that um uh, this is kind of like a soft recreation of a mission I did all the way back in 2018 where I sent a small one-way rover mission to the surface of EVE. It's a really nice way to introduce players to interplanetary travel the first time because EVE is a somewhat uh, difficult planet to get an encounter with because it's at an incline relative to Kerbin. But at the same time, it's fairly easy because it's got a pretty large gravity well because it's, a big, it's a, EVE is a big lassie. So it's got a nice big sphere of influence. So it's pretty easy to... Uh, get an encounter at the same time if you're um, launching in a correct transfer window and then you can do a, a mid-course correction to get an equatorial flyby like I'm going for here so it's kind of a good way of getting your skills refined as a first uh, interplanetary mission and a nice bonus is that it's the easiest planet to land on also it's the most difficult planet to leave but if you're doing a one-way mission like this which uh most EVE missions are, planned or not, um, then it's a fairly forgiving place for a beginner to visit. The only thing really to think about is the uh, the atmosphere. It's very, very brutal, so you want to try and make sure your ship doesn't flip on re-entry and you bring sufficient ablative or inflatable heat shield. The inflatable heat shield doesn't ablate, so that's fine. Ablative heat shields, you probably want to beef up those. Like I said earlier, the amount I put on this craft was fine, but I didn't actually test this craft. Uh, when, when I built it and I think in retrospect I probably should have added at least two or even three heat shields to it to make sure I had definite protection. Now here I am modifying my EVE encounters so that I get a free return to Kerbin. So the aircraft will deploy its payload and then I don't have to do anything. The craft will just automatically return to Kerbin. Of course I'll have to do a minor course correction to make sure that we're hitting Kerbin's atmosphere but uh, it makes it a little bit easier than having to faff around after our EVE mission. Uh, figuring out how to get back home and waiting for transfer windows and all that. If we can just knock that out now, saves us a bit of hassle later on. 
But yeah, it's just a, it's another reason why I found this mission genuinely really fun. Like a, a lot of the time, I'm not afraid, I'm not embarrassed to admit this, but a lot of the time when doing Kerbal Space Program missions, sometimes it can get a little bit wearisome. Like, oh, I gotta do this now and then that and that. It's a bit stressful. I'm like mindful, like I've gotta make a video in time for Saturday. Unlike last week, I, I didn't have time to make a video before Saturday and I just didn't make a video. And I don't like that kind of pressure and it's a bit, it's a bit of a stress overall. But this mission, I just had a lot of fun doing it. It was just a fun mission to do. I love flying SSTOs. I love building SSTOs. And I really liked this concept of a mission. You know, I just really liked the idea of like maybe an SSTO deploys and always like a bomb into the atmosphere and that lands and it's all like, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't put it into words, which is a shame because that's my job as a commentator. But I really, really enjoyed this mission and I really enjoyed this craft. Uh, like I say, there are a few sort of learning experiences from this, and uh, I think that's kind of nice in a sense. Uh, you can kind of see that this is raw commentary. And like I said earlier, I didn't test this craft at all. I just built it and said, ah, that looks like it'll work, and just immediately started recording. And I learned things along the way, and you guys can kind of see how I um, don't learn from any mistakes ever, it would seem. So for starters, I kind of said those big S elevons at the back of the SSTO. They probably weren't a great idea in retrospect because they made the whole thing very unwieldy when flying in the atmosphere. And then probably could have done with another ablative heat shield. The other thing I could have done with on this re-entry module, I keep saying re-entry, but entry module. We haven't, you know, this would be the first time we encounter Eve in this mission. Uh, the other thing I think would have been useful is having some sort of engine available to use after we deployed that lower stage. The reason for this, if you look at the Kerbal Engineer readouts, you can see, so on the right hand side, you might have to bump up the quality to 1440 or 1080p. But you can see, uh, just above Mac number on the right and above situation, it says biome, eastern sea. Okay, it's changed now, but it did say eastern sea. And uh, we need to obviously land on dry land, because this is a rover. And the way I ensure this is basically, I make a quick save just before our atmospheric re-entry, I nearly said re-entry again, and then just see where I end up. And I kept on landing in the Eastern Sea again and again and again and again. By the way, our ablator has now completely burned up, and as you can see, our heat shield, our, our fairing base, is doing pretty well. It's uh, it's getting pretty toasty, but it's holding up okay. Uh, and I had to just keep on modifying my entry, and saying, okay, let's try 60 kilometer periapsis, and I end up in the sea. Let's try 70 kilometer periapsis and I would end up in the sea. So I just keep on trying it again and again. So I wouldn't advise this method if you don't play without quick saves, but really guys, there's nothing elitist about not using quick saves or, you know, the other way around. Anyway, uh, yes, going back to the tangent I was on as initially, uh, having some sort of maybe just like, even like one RCS engine on that upper block, just to modify our re-entry path, our, modify our entry path once we'd circularized around EVE, would be really, really helpful in trying to, you know, make sure we landed where we wanted to land. <laughs> Our descent was very slow. I didn't want to subject you guys to the entire duration of it, so I just cross-faded across to the point where we touched down, and there we are. We've touched down. You may have noticed as well that uh, things got a little bit hairy. I don't, I was mid-tangent when it happened, so I didn't talk about it, but things got a little bit hairy. As we entered the thickest parts of the atmosphere, it did start to flip, and we started seeing some very dangerous-looking temperature gauges. But luckily, at that point, we were quite low down in the atmosphere, hence we were flipping, but it also meant that the atmospheric drag was much, much thicker, and we slowed down very quickly, and we were able to survive. But that's another reason. That's another design change. I was talking earlier about ways in which I would change this. I would probably try and maybe add a ballast to the bottom of this vessel. The reason why it flipped like that was because the center of mass was kind of towards the front of this rover, which in that vertical module is about sort of halfway up or even a little bit higher than halfway up, which meant that with the center of mass that far back on something that isn't very aerodynamic, it really wants to flip. So maybe adding either some fins toward the back or adding more mass to the bottom. These are ways in which I could have possibly improved the design. So there you go. If you want to download the craft file, that's great. Try it out because obviously this, this does work. But I think it'd be nice maybe if you wanted to try something like this, you do it yourself and try and, you know, refine it a bit better. Now you've seen all the mistakes that I've made. And if you want to make it a bit easier, you can just not build it like an SSTO. Like you just launch a rocket and send that to Eve. That'd probably be easier than this. And now it comes to uh, exploring the surface of Eve. And oh, isn't the rover just so adorable. I wanted to find a surface feature to use 
our scanning arm on. So um, I I stopped and had a little look around. I saw a little black dot over yonder. So we we set a course for that and I drove toward it. And yeah, I know the communication dish does look a little bit cumbersome on this tiny rover. Unfortunately, because I'm playing with Comnet enabled, I didn't have a connection to the Kerbal Space Center, which meant that I wasn't able to steer the rover, which is obviously quite a crucial ability for a rover to have. So I had to have that antenna dish deployed just so I could navigate towards this nice basalt formation. And there we are. We can deploy our scanning arm using an action group and gather some science and we can transmit it back to the Kerbal Space Center. And I'll be um, needing to occasionally dip in and out of time warp to allow the onboard RTGs to keep our batteries topped up to enable data transfer. And yes, in case anyone was wondering, that's how I'm able to keep the both the rover and the SSTO fully charged without any apparent solar panels. It's because we've got RTGs on board, which are much more, uh, they're much nicer for kind of cleaner aesthetic, depending on what you want. For space stations, Solar panels look way cooler, but for these sorts of things, um, RTGs are generally a bit more realistic. You know, the uh, the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers use yeah, the same technology as the Kerbal Space Program RTG. And uh, it means you're a little bit less restricted with the overall design of whatever it is you're building. And I guess from a realism standpoint, it makes a bit more sense. As you can see, my version of EVE with my visual mods is covered in thick clouds, so relying on solar panels probably not the best idea. Anyway, thus concludes the rover surface mission aspect of this video, which means we can start thinking about getting back to Kerbin. Now, infuriatingly, as you can see, some debris is left in orbit. Remember when I deployed the descent module, I initially lowered its periapsis to intersect EVE's atmosphere, and then I detached the lower engine at the point where our periapsis was inside EVE's atmosphere. But I guess the two separated outside of physics range, and at that point, the debris didn't enter Eve's atmosphere. It's just been stuck in deep space forever. So that was a shame. But you guys can rewind the footage if you want to. And you can see that I did, de in fact, decouple that part while I was on a trajectory to hit Eve's atmosphere. It would have de where it would have definitely been destroyed because it didn't have any sort of heat shield protection or anything like that. Anyway, I guess that's kind of a shame. Here you can see me performing, oh, not performing, but uh, planning a maneuver node. It probably would have been possible to perform our capture around Kerbin using aero braking because we're only coming from kind of Eve level, which is not a particularly dramatically different orbit from Kerbin. So our re-entry speeds wouldn't have been too great, but we're not coming in at a perfectly at a perfect angle, basically. We're coming in from a slightly eccentric direction, which does bump up the re-entry speeds a little bit, but I guess we're not going particularly fast. I reckon this uh, SSTO could have probably survived a re-entry of about 4,200-ish meters per second. I've no idea. I've just pulled that number out of thin air, uh, but I, I think it would have been okay. But we had fuel to spare, and I thought, let's just minimize the risk and also save some time. It's a bit quicker to capture around Kerbin like this rather than having to do several uh, atmospheric aero brakes, but we don't have quite enough fuel to completely lower our orbit. <laughs> we don't have quite enough fuel to completely lower our orbit into a kind of nice low Kerbin orbit to make uh, landing back at the runway easier. So I just did a few air brakes just to very, very realistic, as you can see, <laughs> just looking at the screen. It's a uh, yes. This is another thing when I said I didn't test this craft before flying it. I just thought it looked looked okay, so I went with it, but actually the center of mass, it would seem, has moved far too far backward, and it's very, very flip-happy and very unstable. So again, you can use this craft if you want. I have demonstrated that it works, but I would not recommend it. Maybe add some tail fins that extend a bit further back from the rear engines. It's the engines that's the weight. You know, you've got two nuclear engines, which weigh an absolute ton, and we've got four rapier engines hanging right off the back of the craft. I mean, what was I thinking? No wonder it's flipping out, but I guess... You know, that was me just being arrogant and rushing things. So, yeah, maybe don't... Yeah, it's flipped, did another flip just there. So I had to be really, really careful flying this. And again, I had to do a couple of quick saves because the big S elevons at the back, they were like caused the whole thing to oscillate on several attempts re-entering. So yeah, this wasn't one of my classic first time, did it in one. This is probably like my third or fourth time because either the plane would flip out or, you know, the wings would shake it to pieces. Uh, either or, really. Neither of which are very good outcomes. And oh no! I have overshot the Kerbal Space Center. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh! <laughs> Another little cheeky little flip just there. Of course, we launched from the island runway. I'm going to get us back to the island runway because the island runway is a little bit more challenging to land on. 
and uh, it totally wasn't because of the fact that I was aiming for the Kerbal Space Center but then accidentally overshot and then suddenly remembered I have this excuse. It was definitely not because of that that I'm landing at the island runway. But hey, it's a guess, I guess it's a good thing I, I started from this point. So yeah, the thing with the island runway is that it's much, much shorter than the Kerbal Space Center's runway. So I've got these uh, rear landing gear right at the back underneath those two rapier engines. I'm going to whack up the braking power to full to really make sure that we come to a complete stop as soon as possible before we go off the cliff edge. So here we go. Brakes are on. And as you can see, they're almost too powerful, actually. I probably shouldn't have put them on 100%, maybe like 50%. I don't even know what the default is, so I really should be giving advice on this. Just maybe not 100%, guys. And the rest is up to you. And I'll tell you what else is up to you. Liking and subscribing, because this video is done. And I feel like there's there anything else I need to add? There is something else I need to add. And I was meditating this, like, when, on, on our Eve entry, and I forgot. But just in case anyone has any doubts, I am playing on 100% re-entry heating. So in case you are wondering, oh, is Matt just playing on, like, lower re-entry heating settings? That's why he's able to jank it like this. Nope, 100% re-entry heating, so you can rest assured that if you're playing on a normal default game, this will work. But obviously work in kind of a janky, could be better sort of way. And that's really a good summation of everything on my channel, really. If you want to support this, like the kind folks on the left did, then they are you could join my Patreon via the on-screen link. There are also two video recommendations, if they tickle your fancy by chance. You can also join my channel using the join button below the video. Follow me on social media for more cool stuff. There'll be a Space News video on Monday. And uh, that's it.